The pioneer of online learning is our next guest. During the pandemic, his free learning resources became even more valuable to students and teachers alike. Welcome Sal Khan, founder and chief executive of the Khan Academy. Thank you for joining us. Good to be us. here. Okay, Thanks so uh, you know, looking, you're, the Academy is a big hit on YouTube. Uh, number one, two-part question I'd like to ask you. Number one, you haven't always been in, in education. What got you into the field? And tell us a little bit about the Academy. Sure. And, and as you're alluding to, you know, I, I started my career in tech and then I found myself working as an analyst at a hedge fund. And it was back in 2004 that uh, a cousin, she was actually visiting Boston for uh, my wedding. Uh, and she was in New Orleans, which is where I was born and raised. She wasn't doing so well in math. So I offered to tutor her. So I started remotely tutoring her in New Orleans. Uh, one thing leads to another. She it helps her dramatically. I start tutoring her younger brothers. Word spread in my family that free tutoring is going on. And before I knew it, I'm working with 10, 15 cousins all over the, the country and, and to some degree over the world. And I started seeing patterns that what was really holding them back, especially in math and science subjects, wasn't some type of innate ability or wasn't that they didn't have great teachers. It was that they had accumulated gaps in their knowledge. They might get an 80% on a test. They didn't know 20% of the material. In a traditional classroom, the whole class will then move on to the next concept and just leaves that 20% gap there that you're then going to build off of, which is going to make the next concepts that much harder. So that's when I started writing software for them that just gives them as much practice as they need to personalize it to where they are, to fill in any gaps that they might have. Uh, that was the first Khan Academy. Uh, and the domain name was available. That's why I called it that. It was a bit of a family project. And then in 2006, a friend suggested, hey, how are you scaling your actual lessons? I said, I'm actually having trouble doing that with 11 or 12 cousins or 15 cousins. And he said, why don't you record some of your lessons as videos and upload them onto YouTube for your family? My initial reaction is that's a horrible idea. YouTube is for cats playing piano. It is not for serious mathematics. But I got over the idea that it was not my idea, and I and I gave it and I gave it a, a, a shot, and that took on a life of its own. My cousins famously told me they like me better on YouTube than in person, uh, and and I took that as a compliment because what they're saying is they appreciated being able to access these lessons whenever they w and wherever they were to watch it at double speed half speed if they were an algebra student and they had to refresh something from fifth grade they no longer had to feel embarrassed uh, so i kept going and it soon became clear that many people who were not my cousins were watching and they started sending me letters saying this is what got me through algebra this is what's helping my children who have a learning disability i'm deployed in iraq right now and this is what's giving me the confidence to learn all the material so i can go back to college uh, when i get back to the states uh, so that's why I set it up as a not-for-profit, free world-class education for anyone anywhere is, is the mission. And we've just been on a journey ever since then. Uh, right now, we have about 130 million registered users, 20 or 30 million folks coming every every month. And as you mentioned, in 2020, uh, we had 12 billion learning, actually almost 13 billion learning minutes uh, on, on Khan Academy. And I always like to stress, we're often known for our videos, but most of our resources and Khan Academy is much more than me now. Uh, we're over 200 folks. Uh, we have 50 localization projects around the world in all of the world's major languages. Most of the resources are going into that. How do we give people adaptive practice that allows them to master concepts? And the videos are really there as a supplement to that in case people get stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and of course, the pandemic has been a test for everybody and, and specifically for education. You know, how has that affected the academy and where do you think that we, we go forward now? Has education changed forever, forever uh, maybe really in some good ways because of this terrible pandemic? We first caught wind that this was going to be a bit of a moment for us in February of 2020, when I remember getting a letter from a teacher in South Korea saying that he was using Khan Academy to keep his students learning as they had physical school closures throughout the country. And at that time, I remember thinking how wild that was that a whole country has shut down their schools because of a pandemic. And then we know what happened. It was, I think, two weeks later uh, that the United States had shut down. And it was one of those moments where all of us at Khan Academy, we looked left and looked right. And I said, I, you know, we said, I think this is us. And we saw that happening because people wanted something that worked in a classroom environment, worked with teachers, but also could work at home, something that can cover multiple subjects and grades. We go, we go all the way from pre-K through college level, calculus, statistics, science, uh, even some of, some of the humanities. Uh, and so we saw our traffic go from about 30 million learning minutes a day to about 90 million learning minutes a day, almost overnight. 
Now, there's a lot of negative about the pandemic. I'm the first to say that if I if I had to pick between an in-person amazing teacher and no technology and some type of remote fanciest technology you have, I would pick the amazing in-person teacher. Uh, but sometimes you have a pandemic and you have it, in, it introduces some constraints. But outside of a pandemic, the best is to use both. You have an amazing in-person experience if you have it, but also have technology that can raise the floor and, and raise the ceiling for everyone. And for us, it's always around personalization, meeting students where they are, how do we give teachers more information so that class time isn't just about lecture, but it's much more about students working with each other, helping each other, te teachers being able to do more, more focused interventions. We know a lot of the narrative of the pandemic. A lot of kids just didn't have the supports. They didn't have the technology uh, in order to access it. And the test scores bear that out, that across the board, especially in math, test scores are down 10 to 15% more than expected. Uh, but it's worse than that, because what, what's actually happened is in a lot of the communities where the schools were able to move to online learning quite quickly, uh, where people where there was not a digital divide issue, for the most part, those kids kept learning. And we're seeing that in, in the data. They had other issues with social emotional learning and, and, and isolation and all of that, but they kept learning their, their core academics, while a lot of other kids didn't. And so people have been talking about the K-shaped recovery in the economy. You've also had a K-shaped scenario in education. And so the other half of students were actually probably down 20, 30 percent. And the data is even worse than that, because we also know that about 10 percent of kids just disappeared from the system. And those kids didn't even show up to take the assessments at the beginning of this year or at the end of last year. So the real numbers are probably a, a lot lower than that. The silver lining to your question is there's more energy than ever because of the pandemic to actually close the digital divide at home. That actually has huge consequences for things like Khan Academy, where historically, if even one student did not have sufficient Internet access in a classroom, it's hard for the teacher to say, hey, why don't you work on this at home? If that gets solved, then we're going to be in a better position to be able to serve a lot more, a lot more students. The other, I guess you could call it silver lining, although it's based on a very severe problem, is the variation in a classroom. Uh, has that has now grown even more than it has. Every teacher has always known 30 kids, they're at 30 different levels, they need 30 different things. That variation has just grown. These gaps that I talked about that I first saw mm. with my cousins, there are now more of them because of the pandemic. But the silver lining is it's not making more people talk about how do we meet students where they are? How do we help them fill in gaps, finish their unfinished learning. A lot of people use that term now, accelerate from wherever they are, because if we don't, you're going to have a whole generation that we're already seeing is uh, more likely than not or, or more likely than historical averages to drop out, to disengage. And that has all sorts of, to your last guest, po last guest point, has all sorts of implications to society, including the, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but like the criminal justice system and, and, and economics and, and, and everything else. So I do think this is a slow motion emergency <laughs> that, that we're dealing with. Uh, but the good thing is people are starting to talk about the right things. Uh, Sal, as far as and I, I know it's a big problem, but what do you think is the most important part? You mentioned technology, and that's that's my next question of, of not everybody has broadband. This is uh, many times a diversity issue. It's a big problem that policymakers are grappling with. What's the most important thing that they should know and do? Is it funding? Uh, you know, what what how can we solve this? Because it's unfair that a, a lot of kids have the technology and a lot don't. Well, the good news is, and this is the silver lining from the pandemic, the amount of money that is budgeted to close the digital divide at home is, is actually quite large. I'm not used to saying that, that there, you know, their quote might be enough. Uh, and I'm sure it's not going to get us to all the way to 100 percent. But, you know, in these budget packs, we're talking about 60 something billion dollars to close the digital divide. And that's the one part of the budget that everyone agrees with. I haven't heard people on any side of any political aisle disagree that that is a good investment, not just from an education point of view, but for an economic point of view, if people need to look for a job, stay engaged with society, et cetera, et cetera, you need to close the digital divide at home. And $60 billion back of the envelope should get us pretty far. So that is a good thing that is happening. I think the next layer is we have to be very thoughtful about what we do with those resources. We also know that a lot of districts, districts right now actually have more dollars than they've ever had. They have the, um, uh, you know, per student on average, depending on the district, they've gotten one to three thousand dollars extra uh, per student that they're going to spend on the over the next three years. I think the big question I talked to a lot of district leaders that they're a little bit worried about. There's a lot of pressure to spend it, but they don't want to spend it in a way that it it it, it doesn't move the dial or it just creates a a slight elevation, but then when the money runs out, you're back to where you were or or even worse before. And so this is where we're saying 
there's very cost effective ways. Khan Academy is free um, to do uh, personalization, to make sure that kids can learn at their own time and pace. Introduce these ideas in after school, use it in the traditional classroom, but also you can do it in an after school setting. You can do it in a summer setting so that kids are always surrounded by this learning. We, we also launched a new not-for-profit called schoolhouse.world during the pandemic uh, to do free tutoring. And we're able to do the free tutoring through volunteership, but we have a very stringent process. We have these really high quality vetted tutors uh, who are doing amazing work. And anyone who needs tutoring can now go there and get it. And then other people can volunteer to give that tutoring. But districts just need to be more aware that these resources exist because mm -hmm. these can really help zone in on what kids need to fill in their gaps, which is going to be crucial if, if we want them to, to succeed going forward. My last question is, uh, you've been in this field for a while now. What in the big picture surprised you? It could, could be during the pandemic, maybe not, just, just on maybe it's personalized education, but what was something that, that you learned just through experience that, that you didn't know going in uh, to, to starting the academy? There's so much <laughs> in, in that. I, I think there's, you know, the, the journey for Khan Academy has been on one level, a lot of things have happened a lot faster than I would have expected. I, if I were to, if we were to talk to 2010 Sal, he would have been surprised to say, wow, there's 120, 130 million folks using this. He would have been surprised that there's 50 translation projects, uh, that you know, there's 6 billion learning minutes in classrooms. There's a several hundred thousand teachers using it. At the same time, 2010 Sal would have been disappointed to see that still the mainstream mode of learning in most classrooms is this synchronous, everyone moved together. And we know where that's leading us. Even before the pandemic, 70%, 70, 70% 70 of all kids who go to community college. So these are the kids who are doing the right things. They're graduating from high school. They're going to community college. 70% don't even place into college algebra, which is essentially 10th grade math. They place into sixth or seventh grade math. And if you're talking about kids from historically under-resourced communities, you're talking about even higher percentages, 80, 90% are essentially placing into middle school math. So the system that we've had in place for hundreds of years, kids are being promoted year after year with these debilitating gaps. You have to keep watering down the curriculum to make it seem like they're learning it. And then they get to college and the colleges are saying, wait, you're not even ready to learn high school math yet. Let's go back to middle school. Huge waste of resources and time for everybody and hugely demoralizing for the student. And so I, I, I would have been disappointed to, that we haven't fixed that, or at least we don't see major change in that yet. Although I suspect in this post-pandemic world, we're, we're looking at a partnership with Howard University that if a student while in high school gets mastery in algebra on Khan Academy, that can re result in transferable college credit to Howard, which could be transferable anywhere. Uh, that's the type of thing that I'm really excited about going forward. Well, thank you for joining us, Sal. Really appreciate it. You're doing noble work, and, and thanks for your, your uh, words today. And, and definitely, a lot of people know of you, but hopefully more after this interview can check you out on YouTube. Thanks for having me.